Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on the book of Isaiah. And you probably know that that's a great deal about Isaiah's life itself. This particular lesson is lesson number nine in that series for February 27 of 2021. I stand corrected. That's actually for March 6th of 2021 entitled To Serve and to Save. And uh, we'll begin, as usual, with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow now before you asking your guidance as we study this lesson, as we think about all that's implied by what we're going to study. May we learn from the experience of these people who lived so many years ago things that will be of use to us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we have suggested in previous lessons, Isaiah is referred to as the Gospel prophet. As we now begin to take on a, an understanding of the metaphors and idioms of the last 27 chapters, remember we said that Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like Protestant Bibles have 66 books. And whereas our Old Testament is, is 39 books, Isaiah has 39 chapters in the first half of his book, and then a, there's a distinct break, and then there's 27 more chapters from chapter 40 through 66, may, which are equivalent to the 27 books of the New Testament. Uh, so that's why some people have interesting, I don't know if someone planned that or whether how they divided this up in chapters or whatever, but that's the way it turned out. Uh, we, we need to recognize in all of that that Isaiah lived in a very difficult time. He used metaphors that are not always easy for us to understand. In our lesson for today, we will notice that both Cyrus, the first emperor of the Medo-Persian kingdom, and then later Jesus himself, Jesus Christ, is are both of them referred to as God's chosen or God's anointed persons. Now let's make a point about that real quickly. The word Messiah in Hebrew is equal to the English anointed, which is equal to the Greek Christ, which means the Anointed One. And we're going to find out that in this lesson that there are three different individuals or groups that at various times in Isaiah are referred to as the Anointed Ones. Or the Messiah. Or the Messiah, yeah. yeah. Many, go ahead, Jim. Tell me about what you know there. Many feel that it would be a great privilege to visit the scenes of Christ's life on Earth, to walk where he had trod, to look upon the lake besides which he loved to teach, and the hills and valleys on which his eyes so often rested. But we need to go to Nazareth. We need not go. Excuse me, we need not go to Nazareth, to Capernaum or Bethany, in order to walk in the steps of Jesus. We shall find his footsteps beside the sickbed, in the hovels, and in the crowded alleys of the great city, and in every place where there are human hearts in need of consolation. In doing as Jesus did when he, excuse me, when on earth, we shall walk in his steps. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 640. It's easy for Christians to pick out a few key words here and there that fit with what we know about the work of Jesus, and suggest that those passages are prophecies of his coming. But let us look at some of those prophecies very carefully and see if what we have suggested is correct. We're not saying it's not correct, we're just looking at it a little more carefully. Starting off with Isaiah 42, 3 and 7, would you be willing to read that, Kerry? Yes. He will not break off a bent reed, will put out a flickering lamp, he will bring lasting justice to all. You will open the eyes of the blind and set free those who sit in dark prisons. And that's from American Bible Society, Good News Translation. Okay, so if you just heard that, who would you say it applies to? Jesus. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Eternal results? Well. In these two verses in Isaiah 42 clearly seem to be pointing to the coming Messiah. However, there are also verses suggesting that God had a servant nation, and that would be back in Isaiah 41, and I'm going to read verse 8. 
but you, Israel, my servant, you are the people that I have chosen. Now remember, that word chosen means, Christ means Messiah, the anointed one, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. So could we have a Messiah nation and not just a Messiah individual? Well, in De Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9, that's what it's referring to. If when God separated the nations after the flood, mm -hmm. he did it according to the sons of God. But Joseph, or Jacob, or depends on the translation, was his chosen one. Yeah. That was the one that was to carry the message to the whole world. Okay, well, some servant passages seem to refer, clearly refer to Israel, Jacob, Israel slash Jacob, the ancestors of the Israelites, and in some cases their descendants, the nations of Israel and Judah. However, in other cases, it clearly seems to suggest that Isaiah was talking about the Messiah slash Christ identified in the New Testament as Jesus. Let us see if we can distinguish between these two types of prophecies. Now, I can tell you there's a, we're trying to really pull together a lot of material in the book of Isaiah, and we're not going to have time to look at all these verses, but let me just uh, pick a couple of ones. Look at Isaiah uh, 44, 1 and 2. The Lord says, listen my now, Israel, my servant, my chosen people, that would be chosen means what? Anointed, right? Mm -hmm. Christ, Messiah. The descendants of Jacob, I am the Lord who created you from the time you were born. I have helped you. Do not be afraid. You're my, ser my servant, my chosen people whom I love. So twice there, the nation of Israel is known as, is called the anointed or the Messiah, if you go back into the Hebrew. So um, even in some cases, he uses the word Jacob. Isaiah 48.20 specifically says that the Lord's servant, Jacob, will be released from Babylonian captivity. Jim, you want to take on that one? Isaiah 48, verse 20. Go out from Babylon, go free. Shout the news gladly. Make it known everywhere. The Lord has saved his servant Israel. Okay, so his servant Israel. Servant passages seem to be parallel in Isaiah with Messiah passages or so, yeah. Yeah, that's how God communicates with, with his kids. Mm -hmm. They have the message, you're supposed to take it out to the rest of the world. By contrast, in verses such as, now this time I'm gonna choose Isaiah 50 verse 10, all of you that honor the Lord and obey the words of his servant, the path you walk may be dark indeed, but trust in the Lord, rely on your God. So the words of his servant, rely on your God, in the P Hebrew parallelism, we're not going to say that Israel is God, are we? No. So his servant, this is a, this is not talking talking about a different individual, right? Uh, the one referred to as God's servant is not named, but in the earlier passages, such as in Isaiah 44, 50, and 52, it might not be clear who the servant is. But when we look at Isaiah 53, 11, and Isaiah 40. 9, 5, and 6. I'm going to look at those two. 53, 11. After a life of suffering, he will again have joy. He will know that he did not suffer in vain. My devoted servant, with whom I am pleased, will bear the punishment of many, and for his sake, I will forgive them. Now, do we Christians have any question about who that is? That's Going back to 49, verses 5 and 6. Before I was born, the Lord appointed me. He made me his servant to bring back his people, to bring back the scattered people of Israel. The Lord gives me honor. He is the source of my strength. The Lord said to me, I have a greater task for you, my servant. Not only will you restore to greatness the people of Israel who have survived, but I will also make you a light to the nation so that all the world may be saved. So is that an individual? Sounds like it, doesn't it? Well, Isaiah 41, 8 through 20, clearly spell out God's original plan for his people. And I'm gonna take the time just to read those verses. But you, Israel, my servant, you are the people that I have chosen. We looked at this a moment ago. The descendants of Abraham, my friend, I brought you from the ends of the earth. I called you from its farthest corners and said to you, you are my servant. I did not reject you, but chose you. Do not be afraid, I am with you, I am your God. Let nothing terrify you, I will make you strong and help you. I will protect you and save you. Those who are angry with you will know the shame of defeat. Those who fight against you will die and will disappear from the earth. 
I am the Lord your God. I strengthen you and say, do not be afraid. I will help you. Now, just as you're hearing all this, does it sound like God is talking to Israel as a nation? Or does it talk, sound like, I'm quoting here from the Bible, of course, the Lord says, small and weak as you are, Israel, don't be afraid. I will help you. I, the Holy One of Israel, am the one who saves you. I will make you like a threshing board with spikes that are new and sharp. You will thresh the mountains and destroy them. Hills will crumble into dust. You will toss them in the air, and the wind will carry them off, and they will be scattered by the storm. Then you will be happy because I am your God. You will praise me, the Holy God of Israel. When my people in their need look for water, when their throats are dry with thirst, then I, the Lord, will answer their prayers. I, the God of Israel, will never abandon them. I will make rivers flow among barren hills and springs of water run in the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the dry land into flowing springs. And I'm gonna, not going to read the rest of that there. So, clearly these verses spell out God's original plan for his people. So what was God's original plan for bringing Abraham and his descendants into that little spit of land between the southwest and the northeast. What was God's original plan for Israel? Well, he was going to educate them so that they could go out and tell the... They were the world. placed at the crossroads of the world at that yes. time. Yes. And their, their idea was, the idea was supposed to be, okay, you're going you're gonna to teach the Gentiles as they come passing through your place uh, everything that I want you to teach them. You, do you think any of what we see in Israel today has any bearing with that? Or is that totally unrelated? Well, that's a it very... Have, it might have come back. Yeah. Somebody's got to have looked after them here and there. Yeah. Well, God had to protect them and to save them. However, he recognized their weakness and the fact that they had failed him. This collective servant called Israel or Jacob... Who, could be, who would be scattered by the storm, but some of them would, would still be happy to call God their God. So in Isaiah 41, verse 9, in the New Revised Standard Version specifically, God said, I have chosen you and not cast you off. That is followed by a magnificent promise in verse 10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hope, uphold you with my victorious right hand. Again, using the word chosen, anointed, Messiah. Well, notice very clearly in these passages that God was talking to a group of his Israelite children who were faithful to him. What a contrast to the earlier kings such as Ahaz. So we know that many of the children of Israel were faithful or unfaithful. Most of them were unfaithful. Most of them were unfaithful, but there were some. And the, the, what I always think in my mind that just sort of baffles me completely when I think about it. Daniel and his three friends came out of just about the worst possible situation you can imagine just before Judah was conquered. Now we're, here we're talking earlier in the days of when, I, when Israel was taken into captivity. But, you know, these young men came out of that terrible thing and yet look at the examples they were when they got to Babylon. Wow. Then God laid down a challenge to the so-called gods of other nations. And I'm going to read you, ask you to read just a few passages from those verses right there. Isaiah 41, Jim? Isaiah 41, verses 23 and 29. Then we will know that you are, you are gods. You, oh. you, you skipped a... Tell us what okay, the... Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> tell us what the future holds. Then we will know that you are gods. All these gods are useless. They can do nothing at all. These idols are weak and powerless. Yeah. So in this section from 40, chapter 41 to 45 approximately, there's numerous challenges from God saying, okay, if you claim that these things that you worship are gods, let them predict the future. Let them create something out of, out of nothing. You know, he says, yeah, they have these God, these things that you're worshiping, they have to be nailed down to keep them falling over. Yeah. You know, what, what a yeah. craziness. So who do you think is being referred to in Isaiah 42, 1 through 7, Carrie? The Lord says, here is my servant whom I strengthen, the one I have chosen with whom I am pleased. I have filled him with my spirit and he will bring justice to every nation. He will not shout or raise his voice or make loud speeches in the streets. 
He will not break off a brent reed or put out a flickering lamp. He will bring lasting justice to all. He will not lose hope or courage. He will establish justice on the earth. Distant lands eagerly wait for his teaching. God created the heavens and stretched them out. He fashioned the earth and all that lives there. He gave life and breath to all his people. And now the Lord God says to his servant, I, the Lord, have called you and given you power to see that justice is done on earth. Through you I will make a covenant with all peoples. Through you I will bring light to the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind and set free those who sit in dark prisons. And none of that happened till Jesus came. Yes. I was say, I had to point to Jesus. Clearly, these yep. verses refer to the future Messiah. Yep. Yes. It sure was. Yeah. Not to the nation of Israel. If you go back up, up a little bit there. Yeah. Um, uh, More? Call, call the other, serve the people. I guess I miss, miss, missed it there. He's making. Oh, oh, I know. It, it was a bit, part of that was Psalms eighty-two. I, mm -hmm. uh, um, you, he's talking to the heavenly angel. Excuse me, yeah. the the non-created. Excuse me, the angels that were before this earth creation. Yeah, it says, and you aren't just. So it goes back to Deuteronomy thirty-two again. You gods that are not the creator, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to die uh, l like like men. Yeah, and then same thing in in uh, similar thing was that, uh, Jeremiah ten eleven. You gods who are not the creator are going to die like men. Mm -hmm. Two two passages there. So what is the role and character of God's unnamed servant? Notice that we have the servant capitalized there. That's a little clue. Whom God chooses and on whom He puts His spirit. Choose the best answer or a combination of answers. Okay, this is, came from our Bible study guide. One, he provides justice for the nations. Who does that? Two, he accomplishes his goals quietly and gently, but successfully. Three, he's a teacher. Four, he serves as a covenant between God and the people. Five, he gives light or hope to healing blindness and liber liberating okay. souls. Or six, one. All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> There's no, nobody else who could possibly qualify for all those things. Yeah. So, have you ever stopped to think or to ask yourself, did, did Isaiah see any of the events of Christ's life in vision? Did he actually see any of that? Or did God just give him these words to, you know, to think about, yeah, someone's coming and is, maybe he's going to do some interesting things? or Kind of carry him along a bit. Must have given him some glimpses of, of something to give him some hope rather than just, uh, it wasn't dictating, we know no. that. Yeah. So it, it must have, have given him some uh, that, uh, hope for the future. When I read the writings of Ellen White, it, it's pretty clear in a number of times that she saw an actual picture in her mind. She actually saw it and then she's trying to describe it. Well, it's clear that in Isaiah 42, we have some very obvious parallels to the prophecies in Isaiah 11. Remember prophecies in Isaiah 11? Let's just look at that for a moment. The royal line of David is like a tree that has been cut down. But just as new branches sprout up from a, stu sprout, sprout from a st stump, I'm sorry, I'm getting my tongue twisted here. So a new king will arise from among, among David's descendants, and of course we know who that is. The Spirit of the Lord will give him wisdom and the knowledge and skill to rule his people. He will know the Lord's will and honor him and find pleasure in obeying him. He will not judge by appearance or hearsay. He will judge the poor fairly and defend the rights of the helpless. At his command, the people will be punished and evil persons will die. He will rule his people with justice and integrity. I mean, you know, who could that possibly be? except Jesus. Jesus yeah. And then, of course, it goes on to describe what the future heaven is going to be like. This is compelling evidence that the servant mentioned in Isaiah 42 is the Messiah mentioned in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. You remember those famous words, a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and he will be our ruler, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, his royal power will continue to grow. His kingdom will always be at peace. He will rule as, da as King David's successor, basing his power on right and justice. From now until the end of time, the Lord Almighty is determined to do all of this. Pretty clear, right? Yeah. 
We are further convinced of the identity by the quotation of, of Isaiah 42 and Matthew 12. Okay. Jim, I think that's you. Matthew 12, verses 15 to 21. When Jesus heard about the plot against him, he went away from that place, and large crowds followed him. He healed all those who were ill, and gave them orders not to tell others about him. He did this so that so as to make what God had said through the prophet Isaiah come true. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, and with whom I am pleased. I will send my spirit upon him, and he will announce my judgment to the nations. He will not argue or shout, he, or make loud speeches in the streets. He will not break off a bent reed or put out a flickering lamp. He will persist until he caused, causes just to triumph, and in him all peoples will put their hope. Yeah. That's from the, Bible. from the Good News Bible, yeah. So, I mean, if you have an inspired writer in the New Testament quoting an inspired writer of the Old Testament, you have a pretty good chance that you can nail down who it's talking about, right? Yeah. And that was how many years later? This was 700 years later. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. 700 years. So God has always had some people down through time. Yep. Yes. And, and, uh, yep. Um, look, for example, at a couple other places. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. Then heaven was opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove alighting on him. Then a voice said from heaven, This is my own dear Son, with whom I am pleased. Yeah. So what did Jesus and his disciples actually do for the people? Very obviously they, one, relieved suffering. Think of, I mean, there were, if you remember the verses that talk about people came all the way from northern Syria, all the way, all from, from Syria to Egypt. Yeah. People flocked up there. I mean, there was nobody else healing the way he was healing. You know, miraculous. Relieving suffering then. Two, raising the dead. Who else is around raising the dead? Correcting, uh, corrected ignorance about God, cast out evil spirits, and relieved the oppression caused by Satan. Now, paragraph three, or the, uh, item number three, yeah. corrected the ignorance about God. That is part of the healing. Mm -hmm. A false concept of God is idolatry. Yeah, right? we're going to see more about that in a moment. By his life and his death, Jesus clearly cast Satan out as the ruler of this world. You remember John 12, 31 to 33. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the rule of this world will be th overthrown. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. And saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to die. And when he says, I will draw everyone to me, how many does that include? That's all intelligent creatures from way back. He's going to reestablish the covenant between God and his people. Now the Christian church and all the rest of the beings in the entire universe. So let us turn now and see what passages might give us a hint of a Persian Messiah. A Persian Messiah? Who could that be? A, pa a pastor not too many years ago says, there's no re uh, reference to the Messiah in the, in the New Testament, uh, but the name, that's what uh, Cyrus is. Yeah. Was a Messiah. He was an anointed person back then. Mm hmm yeah. Well, who is the one specifically mentioned by name to relieve Israel from Babylonian captivity? Carrie, Isaiah 44 there. Okay. But when my servant makes a prediction, when I send a messenger to reveal my plans... Let me interrupt for a second. We just had a verse that said, if you're a god, predict the future, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So now what's he going to say? He's having a message. Let me, let me see if you can name somebody by name in the in the future. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, when I send a messenger to reveal my plans, I make those plans and predictions come true. I tell Jerusalem that people will live there again, and the cities of Judah that they will be rebuilt. Those cities will rise from the ruins. <clears throat> okay, now remember in, in Isaiah's day, the northern kingdom had, had been conquered. But the southern kingdom had been attacked and, and almost everything was, was, knocked, uh, was conquered, except who wasn't conquered? 
Jerusalem. Jerusalem was never co compromised in the days of Isaiah or the days of Hezekiah. Remember, they prayed and then there was 185,000 Syrians, Assyrians dead, but they didn't. But here it's talking about Jerusalem being rebuilt. So that would have to be when? That has to be after... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. After the Babylonians, right? Yeah, yeah so we're already talking... 120 years. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Where was I? Verse 27. Right there at the top. All right. With a word of command, I dry up the ocean. I say to Cyrus, you are the one who will rule for me. You will do what I want you to do. You will order Jerusalem to be rebuilt and the temple foundations to be laid. The Lord appoints Cyrus. The Lord has chosen Cyrus to be king. Okay, let's just stop for a second. Chosen Cyrus. That means that word chosen, what's the another word for that? Anointed. Anointed. Messiah. Messiah. Christ. Okay. Uh, he has appointed him to conquer nations. He sends him to strip kings of their power. The Lord will open the gates of cities for him. To Cyrus the Lord says, I myself will prepare your way, leveling the mountains and hills. I will break down bronze gates and smash their iron bars. I will give you treasures from dark, secret places. Then you will know that I am the Lord and that the God of Israel has called you by name. I appoint you to help my servant Israel, the people that I have chosen, I have given you great honor, although you do not know me. I am the Lord. There is no other God. I will it's pretty give... clear there, isn't it? Yes. There is no other God. Uh, I will give you the strength you need. Although you do not know me, I do this that everyone from one end of the world to the other may know that I am the Lord and that there is no other God. And that's from the Good News Bible. Okay. That's pretty, pretty clear, isn't it? Yes. Isaiah's ministry lasted from about 745 B.C., we think that's about when he was born, to about 685 B.C. Remember, these are, this is before Christ, so we're counting down. The years go down, 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 down. Um, after mentioning a conqueror from the east and from the north, Isaiah 41, 2, 3, and 25, and implying that this was to be good news for Jerusalem, Isaiah 41, 27, Isaiah accurately predicted Cyrus by name and described his activities. Yeah. Pretty, pre pretty incredible, isn't it? Yes. He did come from the north and east of Babylon and conquered it in 539 B.C. He did serve God by releasing the Jews from their Babylonian exile, and he did authorize the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, see Ezra 1. I want you to think about this now. Try to imagine in your mind we don't know for sure who told Cyrus about this prophecy. It was probably Daniel. Because he was the one who was called, the mo most prominent one we know about, the called to serve in the Medo-Persian Persian government after the days of Babylon. Imagine Isaiah showing up before the throne of Cyrus one day and with a scroll, and he says, you know something here I'd like you to see. Rolls out the scroll. This scroll was written, hundred what, 150 years ago almost 200 years ago. I want you to listen to this. Da, da, da. And there's his name. Exactly. And he reads all of it. There's his name again. He reads all of it. His name again. How do you suppose Cyrus responded to that? Uh, probably pulled him up with a jerk, woke him up a bit. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Put this prediction into perspective. Since there are about 146 years from the time of Isaiah's death, so even we're not going back to earlier in his life, which we could do, because this certainly wasn't written at the very end of his life, but from the time of his death to the fall of Babylon, his prophecy was a century and a half ahead of his time. It would be like George Washington predicting that a man named General Dwight Eisenhower would help liberate Europe in 1945. Imagine that. <laughs> what do what uh, traditional Christians, uh, theologians, do with that text? Is it they prophecy, have, or they got gonna, a serious problem, don't they? We're gonna, yeah, they got a serious problem, a very serious problem with this. 
Because the actions of Cyrus are well attested from a variety of ancient sources, including Babylonian chronicles, his own report in the Cyrus Cylinder, and I've, I've had the privilege of seeing that in the, Bab in the British Museum, and the Bible, and there's all those passages in the Bible, Second Chronicles, Ezra, Daniel, Daniel, three different places in Daniel. The accuracy of Isaiah's prophecy is beyond dispute. This confirms the faith of people who believe that true prophets receive accurate predictions from God who knows the future far in advance. That's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Tuesday, February 23. And Jim, I'll let you take that next one. Second Chronicles 36, verses 22 and 23. In the first year that Cyrus of Persia was emperor, the Lord made what he had said Excuse me, he made what he had said through the prophet Jeremiah come true. He prompted Cyrus to issue the following command and send it out in writing to be read everywhere in his empire. This is the command of Cyrus, emperor of Persia. The Lord, the God of heaven, has made me ruler over the whole world and has given me the responsibility of building a temple for him in Jerusalem in Judah. Now all of you who are God's people, go there. Make the Lord your God be, excuse me, may, may, the, may the Lord your God be with you. Good news Bible. Okay, now we're gonna stop, I'm gonna stop for a second. Did you notice any problem between what we, we read just a moment ago and this passage? Who's predicting what? We're reading, what? Cyrus was predicting something. For oh, but who, 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 who's predicting it? I, Isaiah was it. Isaiah. But now we're talking about Jeremiah. Why? Well, they were, they were uh, at the same, same time, weren't they? No, very different times. Hundred years apart. Okay, Jeremiah was later, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a reason why there's this difference. Why there's a comment from those people, and not about Isaiah. Jeremiah twenty-five eleven. Carrie, you want to read me those next two passages there? Yes. This whole land will be left in ruins and will be a shocking sight. And the neighboring nations will serve the king of Babylonia for 70 years. 70 years, okay. Yeah. The Lord says, when Babylonia's 70 years are over, I will show my concern for you and keep my promise to keep bring you back home. And that's from the Good News Bible. Another 70 years, go ahead. In the first year of his reign, I was studying the sacred books and thinking about the 70 years that Jerusalem would be in ruins, according to what the Lord had told the prophet Jeremiah. Okay, so why are these people particularly focusing on uh, earlier up here? Why was the focus on Jeremiah? It's because not because he named Cyrus. Isaiah had already done that, but now Jeremiah says, we're not just mentioning the name of Cyrus, we're saying specifically, exactly the number of years that Israel is going to be in captivity, okay? At first glance, these verses might raise some questions in your mind. Notice that both Ezra and Cyrus, as quoted in Second Chronicles, refer not to Isaiah, but to Jeremiah as the one who prophesied the events to take place. Why is that? Well, Isaiah mentioned Cyrus by name. However, it was Jeremiah who mentioned the 70-year period of time that Judah would be in captivity in Babylon. So here we have two prophets, and both of them were way ahead of Cyrus's time. I mean, yeah. Isaiah is 150 years, almost 200 years before Cyrus, and Jeremiah is, well, 70, 70 years, let's say, before Cyrus. But still, both of them, one gives the name and the other one gives a specific time period. Yes, yeah. it's amazing. So now, coming back to our larger theme about the Anointed One, the Messiah, etc., why did God call Cyrus his anointed or his chosen leader? Jim? He has appointed him to conquer nations, to send him to strip well, kings. You missed the key passage there, the first sentence. Oh, the, Lord, excuse me, the Lord has chosen Cyrus to be king. He has appointed him to conquer nations, he sent him to strip kings of their power, and the Lord will open the gates of cities for him. To Cyrus, the Lord says. Okay, so now, here's Cyrus doing his thing. And what's his thing? Conquering nations, right? Yes. And Daniel shows up with his scroll and says, 
You know, Cyrus, this is not because of your prowess. Someone predicted this was going to happen a long time ago, and the real God of the universe is the one who's giving you the power to do this. And how do you think Cyrus would respond to that? The Hebrew word for anointed here is the word from which we get the word Messiah. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, this word could refer to a, an anointed high priest. That's in Le, from Leviticus 4, 3, verse 5, 16, and Leviticus, Leviticus 6, 22. An anointed Israelite king, 1 Samuel 16, 6, 1 Samuel 24, 6, and 10, 2 Samuel 22, 51. Or the Messiah, a future ideal Davidic king and deliverer. Psalms 2, verse 2, Daniel 9, 25, and 26. From Isaiah's perspective, Israel was a future king. Oh, Cyrus. Excuse me, Cyrus was a future king sent by God's people, sent by God to deliver his people. But he was an unusual Messiah because he was not, he was non-Israelite, he would do some things the Messiah would do, which he def has defeated enemies and released his c captive people. But he could not do, as a, do the same as the Messiah because he was not descended from David. And that's from our Adult Barbara. Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Tuesday, February 23. So now, specifically, what would, it mean, what would it mean to be God's anointed? We've seen that priests were anointed, kings were anointed, prophets apparently sometimes anointed, and now messiahs and Cyrus and so forth. What does that mean? Cyrus must have been, a, how would you put it, a fairly level-headed guy that was a bit different to some of the savages that were in that general area. Yes. Exactly. So, what we're saying here, God looks down history, He says, I have chosen these people to do this, I've chosen that person to do that, I've chosen this person to do this. Here it is. Let me tell you not only the names of these people, but the what they're going to do and given the times. Yeah. Pretty amazing, huh? Yes. So, um, from the paragraph above, we see that the high priests were anointed, and so were the early kings of Israel. But Psalms 2, verse 2, let's look at that. Their kings revolt, their rulers plot, against, plot together against the Lord and against the king he chose. In other words, God's anointed. Okay? How do you suppose Cyrus felt when he learned that his name and actions were prophesied by Isaiah almost 150 years in advance and the specific time periods were prophesied more than 70 years in advance by Jeremiah? Pretty amazing. And, and yes. oh, that's a long period of time. Yeah. How much the language might change? Change, yeah. Can you think of, this is, this is an, a, a story from the in period in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Can you think of another world conqueror that was amazed by what he, what someone read to him from the Bible? Not Adventists aren't really up to what happened between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But this is from that time when Alexander the Great came through mm -hmm. and was on his way down to conquer Egypt. He had to pass through Canaan, and the Jews said, "We're not going out to fight you. We knew you were coming. Look here, it says, right here." I'm not talking about this, but there are other places where they say, we, we knew this was going to happen. And Alexander, Alexander said, oh, really? So they welcomed into the, him into Jerusalem. He spent a little time there and took his troops and went on to Egypt and didn't bother them at all. Yeah. Because of a prophecy. Yeah. So, once again, we see there's a clear distinction between who? The real God who can predict precisely hundreds of years in advance something was going to happen while other so-called gods can do how much? Nothing. Nothing. So those who do not believe that even God can predict the future have really struggled with these prophecies about Cyrus. The dates for Isaiah are clearly known. The dates for Cyrus are clearly known. So many who call themselves scholars have suggested that Isaiah needs to be cut into two parts. With one author writing the chapters from 1 to 39, 
and another author writing chapters 40 through 66, many years later. It is interesting to note that while they are trying to cut the book of Isaiah in half, Isaiah himself was cut in half by Manasseh. So, yeah. so don't some of them, uh, 39 to 55. Yeah, uh, they, they, some of them even tried to divide that last half into two sections, yeah. yeah. Tertiary. Yeah. Isaiah, and what do we know about people being cut in half? Look at Isaiah, I'm sorry, he was 11, 37. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed by the sword, they went around clothed in skins or sheep or goats, poor, persecuted, and ill-treated. Talking about the prophets from the Old Testament. Wow. Kerry? There is, however, no historical witness to the existence of a second Isaiah. If he did exist, it would be the strange I know it would be strange for the Bible not to mention him because his message is profoundly important and his literary artistry is phenomenal. Not even the oldest Bible manuscript, the Isaiah scroll from Qumran, has any break between Isaiah 39 and 40 that would indicate a transition to the work of a new author. Let me interrupt for a moment. <clears throat> yeah. You know about uh, the, what's it called? I've forgotten their name. There's a shelter. Do you remember what? The, the, the. Anyway, there's a, a, a shelter built by the Israelis, partially underground, with that very special dome shape that's supposed to be able to survive a direct atomic blast. Mm. And in that, under that shelter, there's a thing that's it's probably two or three times the size of our room here. And big, and if you can read Hebrew, you can walk right around and read the whole thing all the way around, the whole book of Isaiah from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there is no break. This is a document from 100 years before Christ, maybe 150 years before Christ, and there's absolutely no break between uh, Isaiah 39 and Isaiah 40. And if, if there had been two different authors back that close, I mean, sure, it's still quite a while after the events happened, but if it, way back then, if there had been some kind of a break, surely they would have mentioned it. Yeah. Okay, Isaiah's basic message. Isaiah's basic message is consistent throughout his book. Trust the true God, including his messianic deliverer, rather than other powers. Scholars rightly emphasize the shift in focus from the Assyrian period in Isaiah 1 through 39 to the Babylonian period in chapters 40 and following. But we have found that Isaiah 13, 14, and 39 already envisage a Babylonian captivity. It is true Isaiah 1 to 39 emphasizes judgment and Isaiah 40 to 66 emphasizes consolation. But in the earlier chapters, divine comfort and assurance are ab abundant also, and later passages such as Isaiah 42, 18 through 25, Isaiah 43, 23 through 28, and Isaiah 41 through 11 speak of God's judgments. That's 48, Judah. 1 to 11. 48, sorry. Speak of God's judgments on Judah for forsaking him. In fact, Isaiah's prediction of future comfort imply suffering in the meantime. And that comes from our Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, February 24. I don't know how many of you in our listening audience have had the opportunity to download some of our materials and, and look at it, but this is the amount of, of cross-referenced documentation proof here of the inspiration of Isaiah and the, much of the Old Testament and how it interlaces with the New Testament and so forth is, is just phenomenal. And I would encourage you to go ahead and, and download that if you get an opportunity to go to our website at Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you could download this document. So we have seen that Isaiah's message is consistent right through his book. There is absolutely no evidence for cutting it in two, separating it, and claiming that two different authors wrote the, wrote the book of Isaiah at different times. It is interesting to notice that many of the prophecies that Isaiah gave are similar to prophecies that had been given many years earlier by Moses in Leviticus. So if you're surprised at 
Isaiah's ability to predict, what about someone who lives 700 years earlier than that? Yes. Jim? I guess this is mine. I'm sorry, Leviticus 26, 40 to 45. The Lord said, But your descendants will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors who resisted me and rebelled against me and made me turn against them and sent them into exile in the land of their enemies. At last, when your descendants are humbled and they have paid the penalty for their sin and rebellion, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and with Isaiah, with Isaac, I'm sorry, Jacob and Isaac and with Abraham. And I will renew my promise to give my people the land. First, however, the land must be rid of its people so that it can enjoy its complete rest. And they must pay the full penalty for having rejected my laws and my commands. And there's many scholars who say, you know, because they didn't, you know, every seventh year they were supposed to let the land rest. And, and so... It, many scholars have looked at well, the reason that the children of Israel were in captivity for 30, 70 years is because for 490 years they hadn't allowed for the, for the rest for the land, so now the ra la land is going to get 70 years of rest to make up for all the time they hadn't done it. It's uh, an interesting idea. But even then, when they are still in the land of their enemies, I will not completely abandon or destroy them. Now, why is that something a little bit surprising? Do you remember? Remember in Old Testament times, many of the peoples in the world believed that the world had been divided up and one God was a God here, another God was a God there, another God was a God here, another God was... So they weren't sure when they were taken off into Babylonian captivity that their God from Palestine would be able to hear them way over there in, in Babylon. But what does God say? I will not completely abandon or destroy them over there in Babylonia. That would put an end to my covenant with them, and I am the Lord their God. I will renew the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I showed all the nations my power by bringing my people out of Egypt in order that I, the Lord, might be their God. Look now at parts of Isaiah 49. Uh, if we had time, we would read uh, the whole passage is 12 verses, but we'll pick out just some. See especially verses 4, 7, and 8. Jim? I said, I have worked, but how, but how hopeless it is. I have used up my strength, but have accomplished nothing. Yet I can trust the Lord to defend my cause. He will reward me for what I do. Israel's holy God and Savior says, to the one who is deeply despised, who is hated by the nations, and is the servant of rulers. Kings will see you released and will rise to show you, excuse me, rise to show their respect. Princes will see it, and they will bow low to honor you. This will happen because the Lord has chosen his servant. The holy God of Israel keeps his promises. The Lord says to his people, when the time comes to save you, I will show you favor and answer your cries for help. I will guard and protect you, and through you make a covenant of all peoples. I will let, your, let you settle once again in your land that is now laid waste. Good. Okay. So when will all that happen? Now what we know from Ad, as Adventists from the perspective of all of Scripture when was there a time when Jerusalem is going to be a home for all peoples of all nations and so forth? That's yet future. That is yet future. Yeah. We're talking about the third coming, aren't we? Yeah. God calls the names, excuse me, God calls and names him before he is born. He makes his mouth like a sword and will be glorified in him. God uses a servant to bring the nations of Israel back to himself, to be a light of salvation to all the world to be a covenant and to release prisoners. There is plenty of overlap between this description and that of Isaiah 42, where we identified the servant as the Messiah. The New Testament finds the servant's attributes in Jesus Christ in both coming, in both comings, that is in Matthew 1, 21, John 8, 12, John 9, 5, John 17, 1 to 5, Revelation 1, 16, Revelation 2, 16, and Revelation 19, 15. 
Very Bible good. Bible study guide. Our Bible study guide for Thursday, February 25. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing just, I mean, it's, it, things are just interlaced here. I mean, there's just, everything's just fitting together. It's amazing how this all, the Old Testament prophecies fit what we know about the New Testament. One final point needs to be seen very clearly in these verses. Clearly, we are beginning to see hints that the future life and mission of the Messiah would not be an easy one. Carrie? Thus Isaiah foresaw a servant with a real human nature, tested like we are and proving himself to be the author and perfecter of the way of faith, a real personal faith that can still say, My God, when nothing any longer seems worthwhile. And this comes from the prophecy of Isaiah, an introductory introduction and commentary. Yeah, and it's quoted in our Bible study guide there for Thursday, February 25. Well, think about it, and I'm gonna challenge you out there to think now of what we've heard, what we've thought, the ideas we've raised. Review what you know about the life of Jesus now. What are the incredible evidences, or ex what an incredible experience, or sorry, that was facing difficulties with the entire forces of Satan and all his evil angels arrayed against him at every step of, in his life. How did Jesus handle it? I mean, I don't know at what what point the Father revealed to Jesus as a child. You you may you might, you need to know that the worst enemy in the whole universe is determined to kill you, to get rid of you, to destroy you, to prevent you from accomplishing what you're there to do. I mean, how would you feel? He, he getting a message like that as a, as a fairly young child. I don't know. In the, uh, okay, in the work of soul saving, soul winning, great tact and wisdom are needed. Think about Jesus. The Savior never suppressed the truth, but he uttered it always in love. In his intercourse or dealings with others, he exercised the greatest tact and he was always kind and thoughtful. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave unnecessary pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censure human weakness. He fearlessly denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity, but tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. He never made truth cruel, but ever manifested a deep tenderness for humanity. Every soul was precious in his sight. He bore himself with divine dignity, yet he bowed with the tenderest compassion and regard to every member of the family of God. He saw in all souls whom it was his mission to save. That's Ellen White, Gospel Workers, page 117. So, I mean, how would you feel if you had come down here and you had, you had this idea that all those people out there, everyone you came across every time, you were supposed to save them? Yeah. Your life was, was for saving them. I, I think of a story that one of my professors said back when I was in medical school. One time he traveled to a distant country that I won't name, whose name has been changed, by the way, since then. And um, here they were driving slowly through just hordes of people, masses of people, just everywhere. And he was with the, one of the local pastors from that area, and he says, what, what, what do you do? What do you, what do you think when you see all these people? We're supposed to be reaching all these people. And the pastor just turned to him and said, I try not to think about it. You know, go back up here, the last couple words of, uh, okay, right there. It was his mission to save. Mm -hmm. And another word for that is heal. Mm -hmm. Heal their concept, of their misconceptions about God. Yep. That was it. That's why God saves. It's not a throwing a life uh, preserver ring out there. Yeah. It's uh, to educate. We know that difficult times will be coming to God's people in the future. And we know, are we ready to follow the example of Jesus? Are we doing so even now? Is, is it clear to you that the book of Isaiah was written by a single author? Do you have any questions about that? 
what evidence could you provide if someone said, you know, if you mention this to one of your Christian friends, oh, yeah, well, but that's in the last half of Isaiah. It was written by a different person. Would you say, uh, or, uh, or uh, what would you say? The Isaiah was not written by multiple people. It was written by one person. Um, and at this, d different times, admittedly, in the same person's life, but uh, not, not exactly the same time, but not by two different people. Do you think you could explain your reasons for this belief to someone? And I'm asking you out there. We have seen that God's nation, his people, his chosen ones, were delivered on more than one occasion. We think, first of all, Egyptian bondage. Then we think about being delivered from Babylonian captivity, predicted by Cyrus. We, we've already talked about him being named in person. We also learn about an unnamed servant, capitalized servant, whom we have previously identified as the true Messiah, who would restore justice and bring us back to God. Are we prepared for that? In this lesson, we have briefly touched on three main topics. One, the covenant relationship to God established and reestablished with his people. Think about how many times they went away from him and then they came back and went away and came back. Two, the fact that God is known by different titles or different names which represent different aspects of his character. And three, an introduction to the idea of Israel as God's servant and as a Messiah. It, the, all of Israel was supposed to be a kind of Messiah to the world, weren't they? Yes. The personal name of God in Hebrew is Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. Remember that the vowels are not, not written in Hebrew. Translated as Lord. He called and established a relationship um, with Abram and reaffirmed that covenant later in Abraham, Abraham's life, uh, and prom promised to make him a great nation. This covenant relationship with Abraham or Abram must have been very important to him because God promised to be his shield. Think of Abraham moving to a new territory inhabited by hostile tribes and having God promised him that this land would in the future belong to him and his descendants. It is interesting to notice that this name Yahweh is translated the Eternal One, the I Am Who I Am, etc. What is important for us is to notice is that Jesus took that name upon himself. He is with us, for good or ill, depending on our response to him. He is the one like whom there is no other. He is the only non-contingent being in the universe, the only one who can say, I am. That's from a fame, important commentary. In many ways, uh, God chose to relate his people and read the stories, the many messiahs. God bless. Our kind and wonderful Father. As we have seen some ideas here that might be a little bit unusual, unexpected for some of our listeners, we recognize that you have tried to work with different people at different times. You've even picked them out and called them chosen as messiahs for, for the world at that particular time. There were the children of Israel, and then there was a Cyrus, not even an Israelite, that God chose to deliver his people from Babylon. And then, of course, there was the real Messiah, the Christ, Jesus himself, that we so wonderfully praise and honor and give glory to. May that day come soon, and we will have a home with him in heaven where we can learn the details of the story that we do not yet understand is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.